Father Rob Keresti, was born in Hungary in 1933, and he entered the Cistercian Order in 1951 at the Monastery of Zerk. On September 18, 1960, he made a solemn profession in Lillenfield, Austria, and was ordained to the priesthood on October 2, 1960, in the private chapel of the Bishop, Bishop of St. Polten, Austria. Before retiring, he was a longtime professor at the University of Dallas and retired in 2013. There he taught courses in theology, including Christianity and world religions, Christian marriage and the priesthood, and also teaching Christology, ecclesiology, and sacraments, finally until 2019. He is the author of numerous books and articles, most recently, The Church of God in Jesus Christ, A Catholic Ecclesiology, and Rekindle the Gift of God, a new handbook for priests by Ignatius Press. Much of what you will hear tonight can be found in a book entitled Jesus Christ, the Fundamentals of Christology. It's third edition, published by Alba House. There's a very great appendix uh, that he's going to uh, give uh, a great overview and enter into conversation with us about tonight. So uh, it's very great privilege for me. Very excited to be able to offer uh, to you all the Christological structure of spiritual growth and the thought of St. Bernard. Here to speak about that tonight is Father Rock Keresti, who can now unmute his screen. Thank you. In one of his desperate moments, Bernard of Clairvaux called himself the monster of this age because, because he vowed to be a contemplative monk, but in reality, at least through one third of his life, he was traveling outside of his monastery on the rough roads of Europe, trying to put out fires between kings and barons, between barons and bishops, putting an end to a dangerous schism between two popes. In between, however, in the short periods of time, he could steal away from manual labor and from night rest. He was a prolific writer. Rarely did he write for his own pleasure. Most of the time, he responded with treatises and letters to questions posed to him and preached to his monks in Clairvaux more often than it was customary in the other monasteries of his order. Unfortunately, his theology, to a large extent, is unknown even today. There was a time in 1953, so at the 800th anniversary of his death, uh, Father Jean Leclerc, Benedictine scholar, invited great theologians of France for a convention. Among them, Father Congar, Danielou, Mourou, and others. And there was a very wonderful book published, Saint Bernard Theolo Theologien. But after that, all, all the other more kind of quotation mark relevant issues, you know, occupied theologians. And Bernard again sank back into oblivion, except his um, works of piety, or his works of devotion, they continued to live in monastic settings. So here I choose a small segment, only a so small segment of his rich theology. And now I give a more simple title to it than actually it was advertised, but it's the same, same uh, content. The role of God's love in St. Bernard's thought. God's love for us and our love for God. So in both senses. First, I will outline the role of love in the Trinity and in creation. Then its role in Christ's redemptive work. Namely, 
his thought in the very redemption at the different stages of that work. So let's see first, loving God and in creation. Bernard is saying that God himself has a law. And that law is the Lex Immaculata Caritatis, the immaculate law of love. Not that, you know, love is above God, but God is love. And it is his love that holds together the Trinity into one, so that God is unissimus, the most one, and yet triune. And it is out of love that God creates. Uh, the love of God is the creator and governor, creatrix and gubernatrix of the universe. Everything was created and ordered by this will. It's very interesting how God explains the way, sorry, it's very interesting how Bernard explains the way God is, God is acting. He says that powerful people in this world uh, are acting in such a way that the strong suppresses the weak, the learned ridicules the illiterate. But God acts in the opposite way. He loves to raise the lowest to the highest dignity. And this is how Bernard explains uh, the creation of the whole cosmos, the creation of the universe, so first God created a uh, limus in Latin, the mud, inanimate matter. And then he adorned it with vegetative life. Then a uh, sensitive life in the animals. Then finally soul in humans. And finally unite uh, this creation with himself in the incarnation. So you see for Bernard, that's God's great generosity that descends to the mud and raises the mud up so that it can ascend to God. Because the mud is united, matter is united to God in Jesus Christ. As he says, the lowest and the highest are united there. So this is the background, so to speak, the peaceful, cosmological background, you know, to his theology. But in his theology, uh, the foreground is occupied by the drama of redemption. And this is the most important, uh, the largest, the longest part I would like to talk about. The first man's sin has disturbed the original harmony of the universe. As its result, everyone is born spiritually dead and his soul can no longer keep the body immortal. The body also has to die. This is indeed a punishment for his sins. And Christ who did not have to die because he did not sin, out of mercy, he accepted dying for us. Accepted dying for us so that we may live. But what is important to realize is that it is not simply the, the act of dying, you know, that saved us. It was the almighty prayer of Jesus asking for forgiveness for the sinners. This prayer that he uttered when he was tortured, when he was crucified, this is what saved us. And here I quote him, quote his prayer to the Father. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. There flies your irrevocable word, O Lord, and it will not return to you unaccomplished, but will perform for what you have sent it. Another way he explains what Jesus did for us by his dying is uh, talking about the ointment, the sweet ointment, that according to him flows out of the wounds of Christ. 
and the sweet ointment is like, like honey, so that the flies of hatred all drowned in it. So uh, this sweet ointment drowns every hatred and kills every hatred. Now, because the death of Christ, because of this death of Christ out of love, that's why we have now access to him. That's why now we can enter into communion with him gradually, step by step. And this gradual step by step entering into communion with Christ, this is what I will now explain. And this is what actually I call the Christological structure you know, of our spiritual life. Because every, every aspect of the life of Jesus, every stage in the life of Jesus corresponds to a stage in our spiritual growth, in our spiritual development. So here I quote again. Bernard is uh, speaking in the name of Christ. So it is Christ whom he makes speak. I give you not only my conception, but also my life. I give you all this step by step through the stages of being a baby, a child, an adolescent, and a young man. I add to it also my death, my resurrection, my ascension, and the sending of the Holy Spirit. This will happen so that my conception may cleanse your conception. My life may instruct your, your life. My death may destroy your death. My resurrection may precede your resurrection. My ascension may prepare your ascension. And the spirit may strengthen your weakness. So every stage, as you could see, every mystery of Christ is are uh, redeeming us in different ways, in many different ways. The nativity of Jesus was very, very dear to, uh, to Bernard. And he has a very beautiful insight that is hard to understand, but I hope I can make it somewhat understood. He says that God was so great, so infinitely powerful, so infinitely uh, omnipotent. He could not grow higher anymore. So what did he do in order to transcend himself? He descended to us. He became small. He became humble. He became weak. He became a, a, a verbum infants. And you know, literally infants means unspeaking, mute. So the word became a mute baby. Well, not exactly mute, but he could only wail and cry. So, and uh, in this uh, conception and birth of Jesus, you know, all our, all our redemption is already present. So, because the first step is that we become humble like this little child. The first step is the, that we soften our heart, you know, and become like this child. Bernard says, the cheaper Jesus has become for me, the dearer he is to me. So again, I quote, quote him, he came in the flesh and made himself so lovable that he gave us a love the greater of which no one has. Namely, he gave his life for us. Whoever then refuses to convert, will he not try to hear? What else should I have done to you and did not do it? In fact, nowhere else does God commend us his love so effectively as in the mystery of his incarnation and passion. So already uh, the child Jesus shows us in a way the father's heart, the father's goodness who sent his son. 
but the climax of showing the love of the father actually through his own love jesus has uh, manifested it on the cross it is on the cross that through the wounds of christ the ultimate the ultimate depth of god's love is shown um, is shown to those who are able to perceive it. Bernard's approach to the heart of Jesus is somewhat different from the modern devotion to the Sacred Heart. He sees not the human love of Jesus, but he sees the Father's heart, the bowels of God's mercy. And here I quote, the secret of his heart lies open through the holes of his body. That great mystery of love lies open. There lie open the bowels of God's mercy in which the rising sun from on high has visited us. So you see the point, uh, the open wound of Christ shows not only his material heart, but showing his material heart, he shows the very heart of the Father. So shows that love beyond which no other, no, no love can be greater. So everyone is able to relate to this child, to this uh, little baby who is so, so loving. And everyone, if he is ready, uh, he can understand uh, the love that, show, that is shown in uh, the wounds of Christ. But still, this beginning love, this beginning love, St. Bernard calls amor cordis, an emotional love. So, a love ordered, sorry, uh, even though this amor carnalis reaches God himself through the man Jesus, it is still fleshly because it is moved only by remembering the word's history in the flesh. It is through the sweetness, the attraction of the flesh of the incarnate word that the soul obtains her first taste of God's attractiveness. This love is emotional and prone to exaggerations. It is somewhat blind and can easily fall into heresies, or at least to an extreme asceticism. And therefore, it needs the tempering, ordering, sobering activity of a reason enlightened by faith. So, uh, the mysteries of the earthly life of Jesus can be, can be understood, can be loved, can be uh, embraced, you know, by this love of the heart, which Bernard calls amor carnalis, in a way a fleshly love, because he is attracted by uh, the beauty, the goodness of the man Jesus. And yet already, already when uh, the believer is attracted to the man Jesus, to the humanity of Jesus. He does it already because in a way, the spirit, the divine spirit is already uh, transparent to some extent in uh, the flesh of Jesus. But this amor cordis needs to be ordered as I read. It needs to be um, rationalized. And so after the stage of amor carnalis comes the amor rationalis. That is when my um, reasoning, you know, is able to cut out the exaggerations, is able to cut out um, false ways of devotion and is according to the order of right reason. But still, I don't have uh, the spiritual love. It's still just 
stuck to uh, the manhood of Christ, to the flesh of Christ. But the big change, the big change when the spiritual love can develop is the ascension, is the mystery of the ascension. So what happens in the mystery of ascension is that the disciples see Jesus, the man Jesus, ascending into the heavens. And since they love the man Jesus, therefore, when Jesus is lifted up on high, then actually their affections, their sentiments, their devotion is lifted up with him to high. And when he disappears, when he disappears in the, in the sky, then somehow their heart is also remaining in the sky, remaining in heaven. That is, they begin to love the risen, glorified Christ who is in heaven, who can no longer be seen uh, by human beings. Uh, there is a beautiful uh, scene uh, that Bernard describes when Mary Magdalene at the uh, empty tomb meets Jesus. And you remember he wants to, she wants to embrace him. And Jesus says, don't, don't hang on to me. And why not, St. Bernard explains, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. Because, because uh, you no longer can touch me by your hands, but you can touch me only by manu fidei et digito desiderii, by the hand of faith and, and by the fingers of desire. So that's the next st st stage, you know, in, uh, in love. So after the the love of the heart, the fleshly love, the rational love comes, the spiritual love, when uh, the soul is able to appreciate the divinity of Christ. Uh, not that Jesus uh, takes off his humanity. Not that Jesus is, is uh, divesting himself of his flesh. No, but his humanity, his flesh, is divinized, is, is fully spiritualized. And so only faith can reach him. But this reaching God, this reaching the, the risen Christ, the glorified Christ, you know, this is, this establishes a much closer, much closer concept, much closer relationship. Because uh, this, risen glorified Christ is also within the soul, not just next to the soul. Um, but it's also very interesting how Bernard describes, you know, this experience of the believer uh, when he experiences uh, the glorified Christ. He says that uh, he is no longer attached only to the manhood of Christ, but now he is able to savor, to taste, you know, Christ's uh, justice, Christ's goodness, Christ's wisdom, Christ's purity, uh, Christ's fortitude. In other words, all these virtues you know, for Bernard is not really abstract um, kind of concepts. No, these are ways in which we can participate in Christ. We can participate in the risen Christ, in his wisdom, in his truth, in his goodness. So uh, for him, you know, Christ as truth means uh, indeed Christ as person, as divinized a uh, human person who still remains human and yet divinized. Uh, so truth is a person, not really 
simply a, a supreme idea. Truth is a Christ himself. And so is wisdom. And so are all these, these other values, these other, other virtues. And yet, you know, the soul that develops this spiritual love uh, doesn't abandon devotion to the mysteries of the earthly Jesus, to the mysteries of, of the manhood of Christ. So in one of his works in the, on, on loving God, the diligent Odeo, Bernard describes um, the encounter between the bride and the groom, between uh, the soul and Christ. And he is quoting here the Song of Songs. Leva eius sub capite meo, et dextera eius amplexabitur me. So he says that uh, the uh, left hand of the groom of Christ is under, is under her head and the right hand of Christ embracing her. In other words, the left hand is the mysteries of his life, the mysteries of his birth, uh, of his manhood, and of his suffering and, and death. But on the right hand, in the right hand that embrace, embraces her are uh, the mysteries of the risen Christ, eternity, uh, the fullness of wisdom, fullness of light, the light of truth, and the other virtues. So for Bernard, the healthy soul is constantly moving between these two poles, you know, meditating on the mysteries of the earthly Jesus and meditating on the risen Christ. And you could see that in the history of devotion, uh, the sister is constantly kind of uh, vacillating, oscillating between these two poles. So late Middle Ages was almost, well, not completely, but, but overwhelmingly attached to the sufferings of Christ. That's the time of the, of the tortured Jesus is on the cross. Uh, think of the stations of the cross. There is no station on the resurrection in the Middle Ages, uh, only the deposition of the body of Jesus into the, into the, uh, the, the tomb. Uh, on the other hand, after the council, after Vatican II, you know, people said, heaven's sake, I mean, forgot about the resurrection. We are always just, just meditating on the sufferings of Christ and, and the resurrection we don't really consider. So let's be happy and let us rejoice because Christ has risen, Christ is, is, is ruling. So uh, don't be sickly, don't worry too much about the sufferings. But the two are belonging together. So there is no way to, to choose one because then the mystery is destroyed. That's why Jesus came and suffered so that, so that he may be always uh, close to us in his suffering and in his dying. But at the same time, he is also already present to us as the risen Christ. So the Ber Bernard is speaking about memoria and presencia. So we should remember uh, his earthly life, but we, we should also be uh, in the presence of the risen Christ. Father Rock. Yes. I just uh, have a question here as I'm thinking and pondering. Please, this, please. Is, this very beautiful uh, scheme that Bernard lays out for us to begin to meditate uh, on this life of Christ from his infancy, you know, to his, you know, glorious ascension. And, and I'm just thinking here, you know, we have so many people, and I don't presume to speak for all the participants in the audience, both on Zoom and on uh, YouTube and all those that in perpetuity uh, might want to uh, gaze upon this. 
But I would say that a lot of us, us who are here are people who have a rather elevated rational love for Jesus, right? right. You know, yes. We're people who think about the faith, you know, yes. they're you know, students, professors of theology here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what would you say, or maybe what would you think Bernard would say? Um, you know, how, how would we go about uh, reordering uh, ourselves? Because uh, maybe our, not disordered in the sense, uh, uh, morally disordered, but uh, our love is maybe a little bit out of order. You know, we've, we've thought our way into Christianity. We thought our way into loving Christ long before we affectively felt that way. What would you say? Yeah. Uh, well, St. Bernard would say that that uh, what Jesus <laughs> rising up to heaven, but of course there is there is a, a deep truth in that. Uh, how, how would I how would I try to to explain it? Uh, if if someone lost a close relative, like like you lost your mother or you lost lost your spouse. And this mother or this spouse was very holy. Then, in a way, you are very, uh, you, you have a kind of a bridge to heaven in that person, right? I mean, think, for instance, of C.S. Lewis's little book, you know, The Grief Observed, when, when it's about his wife who died. And at the end, when finally he was able to forgive God <laughs> that that he took her, then he feels that whenever he thinks of joy, the name of the wife, then he thinks God and vice versa. In other words, uh, somehow heaven became for, for him something real, you know, something real. And for us, heaven is, is only just the last resort. You know, when, when the doctor says, sorry, you are terminal, then we begin to think about heaven like, you know, some kind of vague mythological, you know, uh, thing very close to, to the netherworld of, of the Odyssey and the Iliad, you know. But, but the point is, if we realize that, that heaven is the true life, heaven is the, uh, the, the final, final fulfillment, the consummation of my earthly life, rather than Better than some some strange thing, you know. Then then the reason Christ means something to me, you know, and and indeed, uh, it's it's just basically prayer. So uh, that that can that can help here, and and the death of a relative <laughs> that makes it easier. But there is another way of of doing it. And St. Bernard speaks about it in the Diligendo Deo. He says that at the beginning, most of us love God because he gives us gifts, because he, he is good to us. Uh, but at a certain point, if we are really paying attention to God, then we begin to realize that God himself is good. That's why he gives us good gifts. And so then gradually we begin to we begin to love God for his own sake, not for for the sake of the gifts that he gives us. You know, and that means basically loving loving the, the reason Christ, loving loving God as he is rather than uh, only in his humanity. You know, so somewhat of the distinction between loving his manhood and then and being able or tasting not just his manhood, but is also his virtues. Uh, his virtues, right, right, and and actually uh, realizing that his virtues are basically basically beautiful, that his virtues are are such that that there is an immense immense beauty in his divinity. You know, so uh, that that can also also uh, you know lead us toward it. Anyway, so what I would say practically, you know, if if 
someone meditates, you know, half an hour every day on scripture, you know, and, and goes through the scriptures from the nativity up to, up to the, the ascension, you know, then gradually he will, he will get close, closer and closer to, to Christ and, and we'll make that journey with him. Mm -hmm. I think Bernard would say something similar, but a lot better. <laughs> okay. So well, very good. Well, this is a uh, this is very beautiful. Uh, I don't. I know we have talked a little bit about a little bit of a conversation. If you have anything more to say, otherwise we can continue. Yeah, I do. Yeah, if I may. So, yeah. uh, the uh, those in heaven. You know, Bernard is, is constantly wondering about those in heaven. Uh, how do they feel about us? You know, and um, is a fighting origin. You know, there is a sermon uh, in which he criticizes origin because, you know, origin says that Christ is, how is it? As... Um, so as long as we are sinning, Christ is, is suffering, you know? And then Bernard says, no, that, that's, that cannot be. He is in heaven, he is in the joy of the Father, but he has compassion on us. So he has, the closer you are to God, the closer you are to compassion itself. In other words, compassion of God means that he feels what we feel. He feels our suffering but embraces that with, with love and, and turns, it, turns it into joy. So uh, that I like you know, very much. And that's the, uh, that's the way Bernard thinks about God suffering or, or, and, and denies suffering, but, but affirms compassion. And one more thing, and I will finish this. Uh, if you reach that point of, of union with, with Christ, the man and, and the son of God, you know, then what happens that the whole creation recognize you as uh, its uh, lawful master and obeys you. So you are ruling over the whole universe. You know, if you accept God's rule, if you are, if your will is completely one, one with, uh, with the will of God, then creation discovers uh, that you are indeed uh, its rightful master. Of course, I mean, that sounds crazy, right? Because if I am crushed by, uh, by a rock, then how can, how can nature obeys me, obey me? Uh, but Bernard, understands Saint Paul who says those who love God everything cooperate for their good you know so in that sense in that sense uh, everything that happens uh, in my life whether uh, good or or unple whether pleasant or unpleasant you know harmful or joyful everything serves my good in God's plan and in that sense, everything serves me, you know? And, and basically that's the, that's the theology also of a St. Francis of Assisi, right? Who was able to, to be grateful when, when he was excluded from his own monastery and <laughs> was being frozen. But anyway, so it's exaggerated, but, but indeed, so it's, it's indeed very true in this sense. All right, let me stop and, and let me have the questions. Well, thank you very much, uh, Father Rock. Um, we do have a couple of questions. And again, everybody is invited to participate by asking the question in the Q&A box, not the chat box, just a little bit easier for us to have it all in one place uh, at the same time. A question I had for you, and you kind of passed over, and I'd like you to just speak a little bit more, is that you talked about uh, salvation occurring not necessarily in the act of dying of Jesus, uh, but in the prayer of Jesus on the cross. Forgive them for what they know, not what they do. 
Um, I wonder if you could just say a little bit more about that. I mean, I'm just thinking, uh, you know, the Treparium I sing, uh, the, the, the theme song of Easter in my church is, by death, he trampled death. Yeah, so there is something. So maybe you could speak a little bit to that difference there. Yes, yes, right, right. So, I mean, the, the Roman liturgy says the same thing, you know, and, and Bernard said the same thing. So, actually, I did not, I did not explain it uh, precisely because it is, uh, how to say it, uh, the prayer gives meaning to dying, right? In other words, uh, the dying is out of infinite love, you know, and out of uh, prayer for, for mercy, you know? So uh, the physical suffering Maybe let me let me uh, go another way that perhaps is is simpler. Uh, so Bernard knows that Christ did not have to die, right? But the sinful man had to die because of his sin, and uh, uh, and Christ actually uh, freely on purpose accepted to die uh, for the sinful man, so that sinful man may live. But uh, it wasn't simply just the, the physical act of uh, exposing himself to, to be killed, but it was also uh, his mind, his, uh, his soul, you know, that out of love did that. And that love is expressed by his prayer. So the two make one, one reality. You know, I don't know whether it, it makes sense, but at least, at least I think this is what Bernard would say. Mm. You know, and also when he speaks about the, the sweet ointment, you know, that kills, that, 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 that kills the flies. <laughs> you know, the flies yeah, are killed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's pretty beautiful. There is another image that he uses again. He says that, oh, Jews, you are very, very uh, uh, harsh and, and, and hard, hard stones. But you were hitting a soft, uh, a soft stone who uttered a beautiful melody, a melody of love and piety. You know, so, you know, so that's, they wanted to, to kill and actually came out a beautiful melody, a beautiful song of redemption, you know. Uh, yeah, we, we they tripped into a masterpiece. Um, at this point, uh, you know, we have some questions and some people have asked some very intelligent questions. I'd love to give them voice to their questions. Uh, maybe Jean-Paul Juge, uh, who's uh, with us tonight, wanted to follow up a little bit on some of your uh, comments. Jean-Paul. Hey, Father Rock. Always good to hear you. Hey, glad to hear your voice. Yeah, we miss you here. So it's, it's great to see you teaching again. Um, you know, I, I, I was wondering if maybe you could say a little more. I think you may have answered this question already. But I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, Bernard's emphasis on the humanity of Christ and also, you know, kind of this patristic idea, maybe with Athanasius on the incarnation, that Christ's humanity is kind of a condescension to our fixation on human senses, right? And so Christ has to take on a human sensible body to try to teach us divinity. Um, and so I'm wondering if, if you think Bernard would say something like that, or if he thinks that Christ's humanity plays a much more significant role in joining us to Christ, even in heaven, even after we've, we've learned, you know, to have faith in him and, and, um, and even after we desired union with the Trinity, does Christ's humanity still have a, a role with unifying us with God even after that? Uh, definitely, definitely. So uh, the humanity and the flesh of Christ actually is, is transformed, but remains. You know, he speaks about the caro celestis, the celestial, the heavenly, heavenly flesh of Christ, you know? And uh, he speaks about uh, the angels, you know, waiting, desiring the ascension of Jesus. 
so that his flesh, his body, his glorified body be in their community, in their community of the angels. And he says that the harmony is restored, the full harmony of creation is restored when the flesh of Jesus is in heaven and his spirit is on earth because after ascension comes Pentecost. You see, so it's, it's an amazing glorification also of the flesh, you know. And uh, there is a beautiful sermon on the nativity of Bernard in which he says this. Uh, he, ad he, ad he addresses himself to, uh, to the flesh of, G of, of the flesh of the human being. And he says that uh, you flesh, right now your job is to serve the soul. The first coming of Jesus was for the soul. And so be now a very good servant of the soul. Consume yourself in serving the soul. And once you did that, realize that the second coming of Jesus, the glorious coming of Jesus comes for you, wretched flesh, comes for you to glorify you, to, to immortalize you, to, to spiritualize you. So just serve well and consume yourself. You see, I mean, it's, it's an amazing, amazing, uh, you know, vision of, of how both soul and body are crucially important. It's wonderful, thank you. You know, also for eternity, you know? Yeah. Thank you, Father. And why, again, why? Because, because God finds his joy to raise the, the highest, uh, I'm sorry, to raise the lowest to the highest and join them. Ima cum summis, you know, that's how he talks about it. Do we have any uh, comment from Bernard about uh, the life of Jesus from, you know, his adolescence, like the private life that uh, we don't hear about in the canonical gospels? He stays quiet too. Yes. I mean, not too much, but it is to, to actually talk about Mary, you know, because, because he makes a big point of, of Jesus is obedience, obedience to, to Mary and Joseph. But then he begins to, uh, to almost get into kind of a little ecstasy when he says, oh, the, the humility of God who actually obeys, obeys a human being, obeys a woman, you know? So he cannot stop <laughs> admiring that. But that's, that's all I remember, you know, about his, his hidden life, you know, the obedience. Sure. Yeah. Wow. Um, uh, maybe we pass the, the microphone if they're able to voice their question aloud to, to uh, uh, Richard Fragomani. Hmm? Yes. Uh, okay. Th thank you very, very much, uh, Father, Professor. Um, my name is Richard Fragomini. I'm a uh, uh, professor here at Catholic Theological Union in Chicago. Um, just a I had a, I, I text, I wrote you a question about from your reading of Bernard and from your interpretation of his texts, would you uh, believe that he himself experienced something of this, um, uh, this third level of loving Christ, the ascended Christ, the Trinitarian, the Christ, the glorified Christ, that he himself experienced some of this in his own life? Are there, is there evidence of his own mystical communion that way, would you say? Yes, definitely, definitely. Uh, so in the early, in the early writings of Bernard, he talks about rara hora parva mora. In other words, it happens rarely, and it's a short time, you know, that he, that he actually is somehow uh, seeing truth. I mean, truth, but that means God. I mean, God, the Son, you know, he is the, he is the truth. So 
in other words, this uh, this contemplation of of the of the risen Christ in his divinity. At the beginning is this rara hora, so rare. But then, if you read the last uh, the last sermons on the super cantica canticorum, so his com his commentary on on the Song of Songs, you know, there he speaks about a state, a state of being of Bernard, uh, in which in which sapientia, uh, wisdom is living in him, is living in him. And uh, well, of course, he doesn't say in him personally, but he describes it with such, such personal features in, 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 in such, you know, experiential way that it must be, must be his own experience, where he says that wisdom itself or himself is, is living in him and also, it transforms, transforms his soul, so that, uh, let's see, uh, veritas in mente lucet, et mens in veritate se vide. So the, uh, the truth is shining in his mind and he sees himself in the truth, you know? So, I believe that that uh, these last sermons speak about some kind of a, I would say a, a state of, of of being united with Christ that is definitely mystical, but there still could be beyond that. You know, even in the in the old Bernard, there could be still, in addition to that, you know, some ecstasies that are even beyond that the stage of. The, the wisdom living in him. So that's all I could, could say. Mm. I don't know if you, if you have further questions, please. So try and I could try to clarify as much as I can. Sure. Um, Vincent uh, O'Toole asks, uh, you know, we have this glorious uh, vision of the life of Christ and yet, where does our sort of mundane existence uh, fit into the Christological structure of St. Bernard's thinking? You know, our, our washing of the dishes, the doing of our chores, you know, the, the maintenance of our monastic obediences, right? Uh, where does that fit in? Uh, I think that that fits in not so much in his works, at least I don't remember, but in his own life, because uh, he was terribly anxious to do all the chores, you know, that, uh, that a good monk is doing. I mean, he was, uh, he became a monk at the age of around 20, and then became an abbot at the age of around 23, you know. But anyway, so as a young man, he was already, already very weak. And so, uh, he was terribly frustrated that he could not take part in the in the hard manual labor of the monks. But in a way, that was our luck because he could he could write more, you know, so he could not work. But definitely, he saw the the value of that. But let's say the the mundane existence, you know, outside of the monastery. He he never denied, you know, that you can be saved also outside of the monastery, but. At the same time, he did everything possible to, to gather anybody who he could, you know, into the monastery and it was Cistercian monastery. There you have a safe, safe place, you know. But I mean, if you consider the life of the nobility in the Middle Ages, I think that Bernard is not so much exaggerating as we would like to think, because at that time, what was the life of a nobleman? I mean, fighting and hunting and eating and drinking, right? And, and checking on his, um, on his villages and on his property. I mean, that, that wasn't necessarily, you know, so God pleasing, you know, as, as we would like. Uh, so still, I mean, his father was a, 
was a very honest knight for sure. And, but at the end, he became a Cistercian also after his, his wife died. But anyway, so, you know, in that life, uh, indeed, uh, you know, a life spent with, with fighting another feudal lord and, and eating and drinking and, and hunting, you know, indeed wasn't, wasn't quite leading to holiness. And so I could understand that, that Bernard wanted to gather everyone who wanted to live a holy life into a monastery. I mean, he, he came with 31, you know, other people and he was able to manage to bring all his, all his brothers there all his brothers, even, even the, the one who was already married. When, when Bernard approached, approached him, I mean, he was laughing, you know, I mean, what do you mean? So guy was laughing, I mean, I'm married. And he said, well, your wife will, will ask that, that <laughs> she may enter a convent. <laughs> and of course, so it happened and, and guy had no choice. <laughs> he became a monk and a very good monk. Well, I mean, there are some legendary details, but it's certain is that 31, I mean, he just got together 31, you know, young men to enter, enter Sito. You can imagine it was a small monastery and all of a sudden 31, you know, young guys <laughs> show up. It was frightening. So it's no, no wonder that the abbot Stephen of Sito in a few, in two years sent Bernard away, you know another monastery uh, mm -hmm. but anyway so that's all I could I could think about sure yeah wondering if you could say something a uh, little bit to the scene of Mary Magdalene that just uh, this yes needing to be touched uh, only with the hands of faith with the fingers of desire um, also in line with the fact that uh, as Barnabas Robertson brings up in their question uh, that Jesus just simply wasn't available to be seen the resurrected Christ through sheer human eyes, right? Uh, when they saw him, they worshiped, but some doubted, we're told in Matthew 28, 17, right? So maybe we can speak about our able to, uh, how we might be able to perceive the glorified Christ, what might inhibit uh, perceiving the glorified Christ uh, as it happened in the gospels. Um, yes. Yes. So I think here Bernard is, is, is um, reflecting the, I think, the common view of, of the fathers and including St. Thomas. Uh, in other words, uh, the reason Christ is beyond uh, the limits of our physical, spatio-temporal universe, beyond and above, but Actually, he can make himself present, but, um, and this is no longer Bernard, but simply just implied, you know, that uh, he, he, uh, well, actually it is Bernard, but because um, Jesus speaks to Magdalene in these words that, that right now you can touch me because to his moribus, uh, uh, sorry, I cannot put the whole thing. So I adapt myself to your way of seeing, you know, so you can see me, you can see me now because I adapt myself to your seeing, but you cannot see me as, as I am when I am with the Father, you know. In other words, Jesus can make himself present in our world of, of, of sense experience, you know, but he himself is uh, above that. And we can never see him in this life as he is in full reality. Why? Because, because we, are, we are still in this earthly stage of existence, why he is beyond that, you know. So, St. John, in his first letter, he says that we shall see him as he is when we will be like him, you remember, you know? So we shall see Christ as he is in his risen, glorified state uh, um, only when, 
when we will be in that glorified state. You know, as Bernard says, the beautiful will see the beautiful. You know, the glory, glorified will see the glorified. But in this world, I mean, Mary Magdalene can see him because, because he adjusts himself to, to her, you know? And that cannot last long, he, he explains that. That's why I don't, don't hold on to me, you know? And so, in other words, it's, it's not really some kind of a, a fundamental, fundamentalist understanding of the resurrection that Bernard has, you know, that, that yes, Jesus appeared exactly as he was with the Father. No, with the Father, he is, he was already risen, glorified, uh, you know, uh, endowed with power and, and light. Uh, but he, he adjusts himself. I mean, think also, and this is not Bernard, but think, for instance, to Paul, he appears, he appears basically as a, as a, as a lightning, lightning uh, figure that he cannot even look at, while the disciples, he appears as, a, as he was before. So adjusting himself to the need of, of that person, you know? We, ha we have a, oh, okay. I don't know if Elizabeth's mic is working. Uh, we wanted her to ask her follow-up question that uh, we have this tension in the Gospel of John, right, where we, I let off asking Mary Magdalene is told not to touch Jesus, uh, but Thomas is uh, told the opposite and is asked to uh, put the wounds, finger into the wounds in his side. Um, however, we don't have any uh, narration that suggests that he actually does it. We just hear him say, oh, Lord, my God, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so I'm wondering... Uh, you know, maybe what would Bernard say? What would you say? We have these two uh, seemingly uh, contradictory uh, moments in the res life of the resurrected Christ in the Gospel of John. Yeah, I don't remember anything about this in Bernard, but <laughs> what I think is, you know, uh, uh, in, in Greek it is what uh, haptu, right? So, in other words, uh, it is it is. Uh, um, grabbing. But it's, it's, it's not really aorist, right? In other words, it means do not hold on to me, not really don't touch me, don't hold me on. I mean, that's at least the, the way I, I, I was told, you know, when, <laughs> when, I, uh, when I was working with this. Anyway, so uh, in other words, uh, don't hold, hold on to me because because I, I have not ascended to the Father as yet, which, which honestly, I don't know in what sense to, to interpret, because with his resurrection, he is already in the state of glory and, 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 and um, spiritual, spiritual um, transcendent state. So honestly, I don't know the answer to this. Hmm. Yeah. Well, that's okay yeah uh, i know you forgive me <laughs> I, i'm sure I, I i trust that elizabeth will too it was her question oh, so yeah. uh i'm wondering if uh, we might just think a little bit uh how would you see this effective love for god in the baby jesus so maybe um this question that john Kuntz has it could maybe be a paradigm in terms of uh faith formation for children, right? Like, uh, do, you, do you see resonances uh, in how we teach children about the love of God, what can be found in St. Bernard? Oh, de definitely. I mean, uh, I think a, a little child understands, you know, that, that, that God, who is so great that, that he created me, you know, he wants to be so close to me, therefore, therefore he's a little baby, you know. And uh, and when I am I am embracing my my little brother or little sister, you know, in a way I embrace Jesus himself because because uh, Jesus uh, is is the brother uh, you know to to every every baby, 
So he is uh, he is very very happy if I if I embrace and I love my my little sister or little brother. You know, that's all I could think. Yeah. Well, I think uh, I think everybody uh, has their children's homily now. This is it's very very beautiful. Well, why do you think maybe last uh, Balthazar just to kind of uh, we have they're not uh, Hans Erzman Balthazar but. Balthazar Simois asked, what, what do you think the reasons might be for why St. Bernard's theology is still not more well-known? Um, not not yeah. enough Lumen Christi webinars, maybe, I so, think. Yeah. yeah. So hopefully. Uh, I don't, because because uh, uh, this happened uh, this happened in, in the 50s, right? That, that there was this this flare up, so to speak, of Bernardine studies. And uh, I should mention still two other important uh, persons. One is uh, Gilson, Etienne Gilson. That was before, before the, uh, the 53, 1953 convention. So Etienne Gilson's book on the mystical theology of St. Bernard, even today, uh, that is, that is uh, one of the most important, you know, work, uh, books, book lengths, sources. Okay, and then, and then uh, after, after 53, uh, one of our confreres, perhaps you heard the name, Father Dennis Farkasfalvi, you know, he's a scripture scholar, you know, he was also a St. Bernard scholar, so too bad that you could not invite him because he, he was the real, real St. Bernard scholar, you know, he died two years ago. But anyway, so uh, his work on, on St. Bernard, uh, he wrote several uh, articles in On Electa Cister Scienzia, in Comunio, and also his dissertation is a wonderful book, L'Inspiration dans la Théologie, the Saint Bernard, so the inspiration in the theology of Saint Bernard. Uh, so uh, De Lubac appreciated it very much, and and others. Uh, so these are these are really important important um, studies, and there could be others because honestly, I I did not uh, keep uh, keep up with with all the the Bernardine studies. So I, I cannot really uh, say it with, with certainty that there is hardly anything, anything uh, important nowadays. But there are many, many articles about Bernard, but, <clears throat> but not about his theology. For instance, Jean Leclerc himself once uh, confessed that the theology of Saint Bernard escapes me. You know, he said the great Saint Bernard uh, expert. Anyway, I still do not answer the question. The, to briefly, the, the why why there is no con continuation in Saint Bernard studies of of serious theologians because uh, all these questions after the council basically uh, occupied both the good and the uh, the epigon theologians. You know so. Uh, the church, the laity, and then liberation theology, charismatic theology, uh, secularism, so all these things, you know, and, and what can Bernard add to it? But now that, that actually uh, spirituality is very important in, in modern, modern life, even for secularized people who are spiritual but not religious, so maybe you know, uh, there will be a, a new kind of return to the sources of spirituality, and in that sense, also Saint Bernard. There is one uh, one good volume on the of the Analecta Cistercienzia, uh, which was published uh, in nine, nineteen ninety. So the uh, anniversary of his birth, you know, which is about spirituality, but not about theology itself. Yeah. 
Wow. Well, thank you very much, Father Rock. This has uh, been just such a tremendous uh, way into, uh, as you made sure to tell us, I mean, it's not just his spiritual teaching, but really his spiritual life lived and then put on the page for us. That is the life of St. Bernard. So we want to thank you uh, for sharing what you did with us. Uh, we'd like to thank all of you for participating, especially uh, we're so grateful to be able to co-present the Lumen Christi Institute is with Our Lady of Dallas, Cistercian Abbey. Uh, and we look forward to continue uh, this collaborative mission uh, in our summer institute next summer uh, down there in Irving. Uh, certainly we want to thank our co-sponsors, the Harvard Catholic Forum, the Nova Forum, the St. Benedict Institute, and the Studies in Catholic Faith and Culture uh, at the University of Dallas. Again. Uh, we encourage you to join our mailing list, spread the word, uh, and also, uh, if you can, uh, support us and our mission to keep these events going on for free so that St. Bernard's theology is more widely known as we hit the internet airwaves. Uh, you can do that by uh, going to www.lumenchristi.org slash donate. Um, Father, perhaps you can offer us your blessing before we uh, finish this evening. Okay. <clears throat> May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come upon you and remain upon you forever. Amen. Amen. Good. Great evening. And we look forward to seeing more of you, full, more online events and more in-person events. You can find them all at lumenchristi.org.